Welcome to Normal Island, the show where we talk about the very normal stories from this very normal country. I'm Alyssa Gucci and I'm joined by Curtis Daly for all of his political insights. Hello. Hello. Now, as always, we want this show to open up conversations, so please feel free to comment below and get involved. We've had a little break for a few weeks because of life, so let's get straight into it. With the cost of living crisis spiraling further out of control, the government are under growing pressure to step up and do something to support the millions of households that will be pushed into fuel poverty this winter. While it's still yet to be announced, it's predicted that October's energy price cap will rise 81% to make an average bill at £3,582 a year and a possible further 19% increase in January to £4,266. Now, Boris Johnson has essentially said that he will not be announcing any further support um, and that the new PM will have to deal with this when they take over. With the new leader not to be announced for another month, it puts a lot of people into very uncertain positions. This is all the more disturbing given the fact that Boris Johnson has admitted himself that the current government support of £400 per household is not enough. Now, speaking of the new leader, both candidates have been discussing how they would tackle the cost of living crisis, with Liz Truss saying that she would lower taxes and reverse the recent national insurance tax increase, and Rishi Sunak stating that he would cut VAT on energy bills and support the most vulnerable in our society. Now, Keir Starmer and the Labour Party have also outlined their plans to tackle the cost of living crisis, and if I'm honest, it shows that the party are even more out of touch than we realise. On the 11th of August, Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves announced that Labour are calling for the end of unjust and excessive charges for those on prepayment metres, which generally speaking are some of the poorest in our society. Those on prepayment metres are charged higher amounts than those on direct debit payment plans due to a premium being added for not paying by direct debit and the fact that they are not tied into any fixed tariff, so essentially can and do pay over the odds for their energy. Labour are calling for prepayment energy prices to be brought in line with those on direct debits. In a statement, Rachel Reeves said, it's outrageous that people on prepayment meters have to pay more for their energy. Why should those with the least have to pay more to heat their homes and put the lights on? This is unjustifiable and morally wrong. As energy prices spiral, this unfair prepayment premium must end. This is fine. This we can all agree with. Where Labour proved to be completely out of touch is with the next caveat of their plan, where they say they will reimburse the energy companies for the cost to be able to bring the prepayment prices in line with direct debit prices. Yes, the same energy companies that have just announced record-breaking billion pound profits. The move is estimated to cost £113 million for the six-month winter period of October to March and would be paid for by fixing holes in the windfall tax. The announcement is rightly being criticised um, as some have pointed out that £113 million divided by £4 million prepayment customers over the six-month period would save the average customer a grand total of £28.25. Now, Curtis, how out of touch are the Labour Party right now? Obviously, the first half of that policy announcement uh, is a good thing. But the second half, where they are going, where they want to pay back the energy companies who are on record-breaking profits anyway, not so good. Um, You know, we're two years into Keir Starmer's leadership of the Labour Party, but we still haven't got a clear understanding of what it is they stand for. Um, every time they announce something that they obviously think is good, it massively backfires. What are your thoughts around that that whole announcement this week? Well, you're right. The prepay policy is good. It is good. Objectively, it's a good policy. Um, it's not hugely significant on a wide scale. Um, if it's only it- going to affect 4 million customers or people, obviously that's 4 million of potentially the you know some of the poorest in society, but... That's a small percentage when you think about well, I think everybody that's affected by it. I th- if I'm not wrong, I think it's 17% of okay. households. Okay, right. right. But that is a good policy because there is an injustice in which companies, they want to push you on prepay meters. A lot of times they will coerce you into getting smart meters, for example. Um, direct debit is far better because in many people's situation where they can't afford the total bill, they can set their own costs with direct debit. So I'm glad that they've announced this. But that's where it stops. The second half, what the hell are they thinking? 
<laughs> reimbursing the very companies that are making record profits while bills have increased by 60%. Are these people out of their minds? The idea that taxpayers should pay for the energy company's profits, profits um, who are essentially acting like leeches, is beyond belief. Now, of course, the reception of this policy announcement has gone down as well as a cup of sick. Um, it's insulting. It's insulting. And it looks like a very right-wing Tory policy. But it says nothing about, as I said, the costs right now. And if you break it down, it turns out it's 8p per day mm. that people are saving. Um Gordon Brown has actually even intervened and upstaged Keir Starmer because Keir Starmer was on holiday, saying that Labour should be taking these essential services, i.e. public services, into public ownership. Now, of course, the caveat being that it should be sold off once they are stable, which is utterly stupid. Um, of course, if something is... Why should we socialise the losses and then capitalise the profits um, if if the public service is doing well, great. It should it should be in our hands because then we all win. Um, Nationalisation shouldn't be a thing where it's done in an emergency. It should be done uh, permanently. But at least Gordon Brown is saying something. Mm. And I believe he wrote, I think it was in The Guardian, and he took a swipe at Keir Starmer because he's on holiday and he's not announced anything particularly significant. Policy aside, just think how it looks it's going to go through the media. It's going to be deconstructed. We're doing that now. And the message it says to people is, one, we're not going to, our policy isn't adequate to deal with the crisis. And number two, we're actually on the side of big business and the profiteers because we're going to be giving their money back, which makes no sense because it comes from a windfall tax. So they're taxing the companies and then giving the money back to them. That's not going to go down well with the wider public. So I really, really don't know what economic strategy these guys are thinking. These these guys are supposed to be the sensible operators. Do you think it's maybe just incentive, like to try and get the energy companies on board with the policy? So they're basically saying we want to, um, yeah, bring prepayment prices in line with direct debit prices, but obviously that's going to cost your company. So therefore, if we make up the difference they'll get on board with doing it but then surely as the whoever was, would be the governing party that they rule the country they make the decisions like can't they force their hands to do it i guess not if they're not in public ownership i mean like, i don't know my thought is that maybe it's just it to incentivize right it's, it's possible that he's trying to play off both sides here uh if that's the case because they have turned around and said that they are the party of business or whatever well yeah <laughs> big business but yeah if they're trying to both sides this and try and play one off each other right first of all when you look at it that's a classic thatcherite um trickle down policy which is basically if we uh, let the richer get richer if we cut their taxes and cut their regulations and burden then eventually the excess profits will be reinvested into the company reinvested into people and wages well, that doesn't happen, as we know, because, uh, you know, your job as a capitalist, your sole job is to make as much profit for your company as possible yeah. and to spend as little as possible. So if a government turns around to you and says, hey, look, we're going to cut your taxes, we're going to increase your profits, they're not going to go, well, thank you so much for that. Now I'm, I'm such a good person. I'm going to use that extra money you've given me and pay my staff better. They're going to say, thank you for that. That's made my shareholders even happier. They're going to get bigger dividends. And right. So, and I wouldn't be surprised if Keir Starmer is doing that. Um, but I, I, I'm really struggling to see um, the logic in this policy. Mm. They re And they didn't need to announce that as well. They could have just said the first part, which is we're going to equalize the payments across prepay and but direct then you, debits. But then you know that they would get questioned on like the costings and where the costing was coming from. And then it kind of goes hand in hand. Right, but then they've just, that's the thing. They've said they're going to give the money back to the company. So that's giving away revenue, not bringing it in. So that's what doesn't make any sense. It would make more sense to say, we're going to raise funds to take the hit on the company's profits when bringing, you know, equalizing the pay. And we're going to do it by raising taxes. Then you can say, that's how you're going to pay for it. But they're, what they're saying is completely mind boggling. It's, we're going to 
tax these companies and then give them a slice of it back. So it's just a tax cut while spending more money. That's no different to what Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak were saying. We're going to cut taxes and then we're also going to spend money to recover the economy. Mm. Well, Labour have since announced that um, they are also in favour of keeping the price cap the same at its current level of £1,971, which is in line with what the Lib Dems are yes, yes. saying. Um, but again, surely this is just the bare minimum expectation. Obviously, we don't want it to get any higher. If anything, we want it to go down lower. So saying, well, let's just keep it the same then. It's not necessarily a groundbreaking policy. Right. Okay. So uh, it's a couple of days since this announcement and the last policy announcement. But this crisis has been going on for months and months and months. So He's taken his time, but finally, yes, I agree that actually this is a far better policy. It's a half decent policy. Um, at least rhetorically, he attempts to try and match the scale of the crisis, but it's very much in Keir Starmer's form that he's behind the curve on this. He should be leading, he should be chasing yeah. other, other, parties other party and... policies. Um, he should be making the case to the country that he's the better man to lead the country. Um, but you're right. It doesn't say anything. And this is the bottom line. It, I, I say it's half decent policy from the Labour Party, but that just shows how uh, low the bar is, because actually this is the bare minimum. It says nothing about the already increased prices. So it doesn't get struggling people out of trouble. It just means that struggling people won't be further, further, pushed, yeah. further or sent into poverty. So... Yeah, I mean, it's half decent. It's a bit late. Um, but, you know, many of the so-called sensibles in the mainstream media were defending Starmer's lack of policy because he's not in government. He's in opposition. I've generally heard some excuses uh, from people, some Starmerites or those that back his iteration of the Labour Party, that the opposition shouldn't be coming up with the policies because they're not in government. And if they did, the Tories would steal their policies. That's a good thing. You want them to do that. For the liberal commentariat, they see politics as red team good, blue team bad. But socialists like me, I actually care about policy. So if the government wanted to steal a good substantive policy from the Labour Party and implement it themselves, that's good. Yeah, because it benefits people. Of course. And this is where liberal pundits and many in the legacy media, they clearly don't understand the art of negotiation. When in opposition, you should be arguing for really radical proposals, force the hand on the government, force them onto your terrain, you create a debate, and then they would implement, uh, you know, inevitably it will be watered down, it'll be the watered down version, but they would implement that. So again, his, his, his policies are weak. This latest policy, yes, right direction. Um, but apart from that, the politics of Keir Starmer, dreadful. How likely do you think it is for the energy companies and potentially other sort of services to be nationalised? How likely do you think that that is? It's, def it's coming up way more in conversation. Obviously, we know it was a big policy of like Jeremy Corbyn um, that was completely like shut down and mocked during his uh, like election campaigns mm -hmm. and stuff. But it is coming up in conversation way more and we're seeing people from the right, people from the left and in the middle all talking about it. it is it going to happen? Yeah, I would say so. I think that actually the response to the energy crisis, the cost of energy crisis, will be similar to the 2008 banking crash. The response will be the same, which will be put certain energy companies into public ownership, but they'll do it temporarily. So they're going to do it to save capitalism once again, because capitalism crashes every 10, 20 years. There's always an economic crisis and the state has to intervene. That's when you get consensus from the left, center and right. They will, they will support state intervention to prop up the businesses. The problem is, and it's the reason why we still haven't dealt with the crisis 15 years ago of the 2008 banking crash, is we then sell it all off again. Mm. So I think... And, and France has, has already done this. They, they've got a public ownership of the EDF, which is why, partly why um, 
<laughs> the increase of energy has only got up by like four percent. Yeah, you know, this France is leading the way on that. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think that, and it would be probably done under a conservative government. I actually trust more the conservatives do that than Keir Starmer because he's so fixated on bec- looking sensible that he would, he would do anything but nationalisation. But that will be the zeitgeist. Unfortunately, it will be temporary and they will sell it off again. Surely the logistics of doing it, though, is not worth then reversing it once we kind of get out of trouble. You just hit the nail on the head. There's no logical reasoning why they would do this? Okay, well, when we talk about nationalizing nationalization of public utilities, a lot of people are saying, well, nationalization is just ideological. That's what Keir Starmer said. He said, I'm a pragmatic person. I'm not going to commit to nationalizing water and energy because nationalization is too ideological and I'll, I'm a pragmatist. The complete opposite is true. Privatization is ideological. Because we know that nationalization works. We know what we need to do in order to create more investment in services. That means paying the staff better. It also means we can upgrade our technology and our... Because the, the, the trains in this country are, are fucking terrible. They're awful. They never turn up on time. They haven't been updated for a long time. Crummy, disgusting. Buses are the same. Buses are the same. Um, Andy Byrne in Manchester's leading the way on that. So you would say, well, what would you do to make sure um, it's highly invested and it's fit for the 21st century? Well, you would want to recuperate so much profits that's going off to these big companies. Nationalization does that. So nationalization isn't ideological, it's pragmatic. Privatization is ideological. So when people say, oh, we don't want to nationalize it, they, they are so wedded against the idea of nationalization that they don't want to do it. That's why the response will be to sell it off again. They're going to nationalize these companies to get us out of the shit, but they're going to sell it off because they're ideologically wedded to privatization. That is why. Okay, well, you mentioned buses and trains there. So I'm going to use that to caveat into our next story. So moving on, RMT General Secretary Mick Lynch, you see what I did there? I love I love what you <laughs> Has come under fire this week for comments that he has made about Ukraine. In an interview with the New Statesman, he said, the EU also provoked a lot of trouble in Ukraine. It was all about being pro-EU and all of the rest of it. There were a lot of corrupt politicians in Ukraine. And while they were doing that, there were an awful lot of people playing with Nazi imagery and going back to the war and all that. So it's not just that this stuff has sprung from one place. Naturally, people took to social media to voice their outrage at Lynch's comments, accusing him of being a Putin apologist and pro-Kremlin. In a tweet by Benedict Rogers, he writes, We should always be humble and self-critical, but that should not mean appeasing brutal, genocidal dictators or surrendering to bullies. Mick Lynch should focus on getting a fair deal for railway workers and getting our trains running again, not appeasing Putin or CCP. Another tweet reads, why do all good union communicators have to be Putin enablers? What this shows is that people do not like nuance. They want clear-cut opinion. If you are critical of one thing, then that must mean that you support the other. We see this in every conversation around Israel and Palestine. If you are critical of Israel or voice support for Palestine, you're therefore anti-Semitic. We see it regularly with Ukraine and Russia. If you are critical of anything to do with Ukraine, who are seen as the goodies in this war, then you must be a Russian sympathizer and support Russia, when realistically, you can be critical of both. You can condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine and also criticize Ukraine for some of their views and policies over the years. Much of Eastern Europe does still have some very right-wing, borderline fascist views, but people don't like to hear that. They want you to pick a side. So... Curtis, what more can you add to this conversation? Well, you're right. There is no nuance when it comes to, especially foreign policy, once again in the media. Um, Mick Lynch, okay, well, first of all, I don't think he said anything that particularly controversial. He wasn't like, oh, I love Putin. The invasion is justified. Um, First of all, Ukraine does have a far-right neo-Nazi militia. It has a far-right presence. Uh, they're also using the war to recruit people to their far-right agenda. There's nothing wrong with that statement. Um, actually, it's just a fact. Uh, but liberals see war through a lens of goodies and baddies. Uh, there's no nuance. So now we've got war-hungry 
idiots calling Lynch a Putin puppet. Um, it was actually the same with Amnesty. Amnesty came out, and by the way, Amnesty is consistently called out Russia for their war crimes. But then they criticized Ukraine. Um, some of the tactics of the Ukrainian armed forces um, put innocents in harm's way. Um, but apparently, Amnesty, according to liberal pundits, is now a Kremlin mouthpiece. They were always happy with Amnesty beforehand. Just because you disagree with people doesn't make them Putin stooge and straight up pointing out facts uh, shouldn't even land you in any controversy. It's To me, it's, it's like cult-like behavior. It is cult-like behavior. The West should support Ukraine against Russian aggression. Everyone believes that. No one thinks otherwise. Uh, no socialists think that, except for idiot tankies, but we ignore them anyway. I wouldn't be surprised if liberals now denounced the whole of the RMT, denounced unions, and started to sway against them because it's been poisoned by the god-awful Nick Lynch. Um, and it wouldn't be the first time because mm. transformative and much-needed policies of the last two Labour manifestos were completely undermined because liberals used Jeremy Corbyn as a red line. Um, in reality, it was, it was their convenient excuse to not support these types of movements. In terms of his pro-EU lines, I'm not actually quite sure what he's referring to. Um, there are, of course, elements of standing in solidarity with white nations in which we don't do the same with nations predominantly of color, um, especially of the global south. Possibly that's what he's talking about. I don't know. Um, possibly he was talking about the fact that Russia feels threatened by the EU. Mm -hmm. um, its aggression was just a response to uh, the growth of the EU and obviously NATO. But if that's the case, if that was the argument he was making, that sounds like an analysis of Putin, rather a, a, a analysis of what he was doing, or why he was doing what he's doing, not an opinion on the matter. Um, but look, he's not a politician. Uh, he's not a leader of a political party. He is the leader of a trade union and his views on foreign policy are not all that important. That's what confuses me why this has even come up into conversation because why are people interviewing Mick Lynch and asking him about Ukraine when, like you say, he's the leader of a trade union whose members are currently striking? Like, what? what's... We don't need to know, like, well, what's, what's sure, the, our business? Yeah. So, like, of knowing what's the point of asking? Well, I mean, it's, not, I it's not got anything to do with... With, with what he's doing, why he's currently in the media so much. I slightly disagree because I do think that you do want to know someone's opinion on something, and I understand why. And it's not really related to. It's, it's what not related. Is no, going but I suppose with him. He's he's a leading British political figure now. That's the case, and of course, he's made statements in the past about against Russian aggression. I can understand why some people ask about what's the position on position on the RMT. So I'm not really offended by those asking about what his views are. It's the response from the unsensible sensibles in the media who are going absolutely crazy over the things he's saying and are not even particularly controversial. And it's not necessarily just Mick Lynch. Anybody who says something that's not, let's just try and start another nuclear war then your, your, your Kremlin propaganda or your part of Putin's puppet. Jeremy Corbyn um, made a few comments recently about, you know, why we continue to send arms to Ukraine. Yeah. It ends up in, sometimes ends up in the wrong hands. And it's essentially fueling a forever war and yeah, an unwinnable war. because he said it's not, uh, we shouldn't just keep basically plowing mm. arms into Ukraine. We need to get on, at, at the table and come up with some yeah. kind of, way to end it but again even off those comments i remember seeing a, a tweet that said that he yeah was uh it said basically like he had said we shouldn't be sending arms into ukraine and i can't even remember exactly mm. what it said but you know what i mean like it and it, it just slightly took out of context what he yeah. said or slightly twisted it and actually that's not what he said he just said it can't continue forever well contrary contrary to what a lot of the media portray corbin as as this evil monster He's very collaborative, especially mm. in the way he's in the, in the way he talks. Uh, when he talks about foreign policy, and we was talking about that, he wasn't saying we should not send arms. He's very much like, let's think of the other, let's think of the other side. So he just and poses, long term. He, he poses questions. He says, "Is it the right thing to do?" He's not yeah. necessarily saying we shouldn't do it. He's just saying, "Is that the right strategy?" That sends 
people to lose their minds and their brains rot over it. And I don't even know if I necess- necessarily agree with Jeremy Corbyn. I, to a degree, I support sending arms to an ally against Russian aggression, but simply saying, okay, but continue to do this forever, is that a good strategy? That's a, a valuable contribution to debate. Yeah. But no, he is, of course, Putin stooge. And, and it's, it's, it's incredible that we don't have a sensible adult debate when it comes to foreign policy because the lack of debates leads to more war. And there are many, <laughs> I keep on banging on about liberals because there's a lot to shit on. Liberals love a forever war. They love the simplification of war. Um, goodies but actually, and baddies. Goodies and baddies. But we need to be careful. We don't want to provoke Putin into a nuclear war. That's the last thing we want. And if Mick Lynch or Jeremy Corbyn is taking the line of how do we minimalize deaths and casualties, whether it's popular, whether you don't like it or not, they're trying to do it on a humanitarian perspective, even if you disagree. Even if you think they're just naive, I don't think this helps, that's completely fine. Yeah. Maybe they are being naive. But say that and try and work with people or to convince people that's not the way, but to just shit all over them, make these people yeah. a completely inhabiting another universe and then there's obviously supporters of those people they're just going to think you're out of touch which is they are out of touch we're all too quick to just shut people's opinions down for being wrong Mm. without necessarily thinking of where that opinion is coming from potentially yeah Right, let's move on to our last story of the evening and we're circling back to our likely future PM, Liz Truss. She has also been brought under fire this week for offensive remarks made about the Jewish community. In a new policy reveal, Truss has set out a plan to overhaul woke civil service culture that strays into anti-Semitism, although fails to explain which parts are actually anti-Semitic. This hasn't sat too well with civil servants, uh, with Dave Penman, the general secretary of the FDA union, which represents senior civil and public servants, saying the conservatives have been in government for more than 12 years now. And for most of that time, Liz Truss has been a minister. So accusations of civil service woke are a little ironic given it's essentially a criticism of their own leadership. She provides no evidence for her accusations that many civil servants will find both insulting and abhorrent. In the statement, Trust goes on to say, many Jewish values are conservative values and British values too. For example, seeing the importance of family and always taking steps to protect the fam- family unit and the value of hard work and self-starting and setting up your own business, which many have blasted as offensive stereotyping. Mike Katz of the Jewish labor movement added, we're not sure what the woke civil service culture that strays into anti-Semitism is, but what we are sure is that this is a desperate and divisive attempt by Liz Truss to drag Jews into her campaign to win over the conservative membership with nonsense buzzword pledges. That's what I take from her statement. It feels very buzzwordy without actually saying anything of importance. And it's another example of the right's obsessions with wokeism. Curtis, what is going on here? So that's a nonsense, isn't it? The words that came out of Liz Truss's mouth is unbelievable. And yes, it is essentially, there's nothing in that statement apart from just random buzzwords collected together to create some emotional <laughs> response. Um, but I, what I find incredibly funny about this, though, is there is now an outrage from her comments because the anti-Semitism charges are now against centrists and those in the establishment. So they're angry now, but of course, when the charge of anti-Semitism and a lot of it, when, when, when the bullshit um, anti-Semitism charges were against the left, crickets, no one gave a shit. But it's funny now people are kicking up a fuss because it's the people we like. That aside, I, I have no idea what she's talking about. What's funny and what's ironic, in her second statement, she then says something very anti-Semitic mm. in the trope between Jewish people and money and that's businesses. What, that's what the backlash is, is that she's accusing, well, it appears the entirety of civil servants of being anti-Semitic and having a an anti-Semitic woke culture or whatever the hell that means. Um, but yeah, like you say, she's kind of making anti-Semitic comments herself in a way of justifying why she said what she mm. said. And that's what's, I guess, backfire. Yeah, it should backfire, as it should have done previously when against, against Socialists and Jeremy Corbyn. Mm. Uh, in the last five years, the attacks in the left, or on the left in terms of anti-Semitism, 
has been successful. The idea that anti-Semitism is almost a feature of socialists, that's also been successful. Being left-wing, you are not already you are already under the suspicion of anti-Semitism and there's zero pushback from the media. But I think, I think it's maybe going a bit too far. And what do I mean by that? I say that a lot of people are going to start to smell the bullshit. The problem we have is that this was completely predictable. When you trivialize any issue, it then becomes, um, to, to most people, people then start thinking everything, everything is a smear. That was predictable. More and more people are going to start to say that the charge of anti-Semitism is BS, it's been weaponized entirely, and any charge, even if true, will be downplayed and ignored. But that is the space that the Labour right, centrists, and right-wingers, especially in the media, have created. They're kind of reaping what they're sowing. They purposely blurred the lines between real cases of anti-Semitism with false claims. It's now spreading across the political spectrum, now being used by Tory leadership candidates. So out of all this mess, all this crap, just as always, the biggest losers will be the Jewish people. Do you think it's fair to say that if this was somebody on the left that had said it, we would have heard like far more uproar? Oh, without a doubt. Calls without to, a be, doubt. to step down and yeah. whatever else. It, it's McCarthy. That's the thing. It's acceptable to charge that against the left. Not specifically about anti-Semitism. The left as a whole is not seen as, as a serious political actor. Out of all the factions and politics, the left is allowed to be smeared, it's allowed to be lied to, and there's no accountability. And the media and those in the Labour Party, or supposedly centre-left progressive party, those in think tanks all either ignore it or add to the pile on against the left because they're not seen as legitimate. Because this is going after civil servants, again, it's wrong, but largely made up of people in centrist circles and it's part of the establishment, that charge is now wrong. So it has a wider implication of politics as a whole, but as I just said before, all throughout this crap, it's the Jewish people that lose because using their identity as political football, no matter no matter who the faction is, it trivializes it yeah. and it puts these people in danger. And those that are making statements, these incredibly ridiculous statements as Truss has done, do not care about the Jewish people because it harms them. It's just an intro, it's a talking point because they know it'll get conversations. Well, that's the thing. I don't even know how. Because where is that? Who is that appealing to? I mean, she's in a conservative uh, campaign, leadership campaign. She can talk about all the white BS all she wants, but I'm not quite sure what she, the charge of anti-Semitism has to do with the civil service and how it's going to drum up some support with conservatives. I have no idea what she's talking about. I don't think anybody does. Yeah, that is a good point because obviously she's, trying to appeal to already conservative members. This isn't a general election where she's trying to sway voters and she's trying to say to people of the Jewish community, oh, well, don't vote for Labour because anti-Semitism. But that's not what this is. This is She's trying to win over already right. and conservative the, members. And the so what's, the, what's on, the point of the comments? Like well, the, it, and it makes sense because the attack is on civil servants in government. Yeah. So yeah, you're attacking yourself. Yeah. That, again, that makes absolutely no sense to me and i just think how far has britain fallen mm. when the three biggest political uh candidates are keir starmer rishi sunak and liz trust now rishi Sunak will not win liz trust will be our prime minister we've got a yeah i was gonna say i can't see this really impacting her leadership campaign it won't impact way. it at all it just means that we have liz trust we've gone for a bumbling idiot who well he pretends to be a bumbling idiot. He's very smart in, in ways. Um, an awful man. To Liz Trust, who seemingly is an awful woman. And then we have Keir Starmer, who was morally not that far away from them. I can't, yeah, I can't say that I feel particularly positive about having either Liz Trust or Rishi Sunak in charge. But I think actually I'd maybe prefer Rishi. I, I don't know. But then he also said... Um, he was going to put people in re-education camps because he oh, yeah. like, criticised the country. Well, that'd so, be me and you straight in there for talking about them on this show. I think a lot of people will be in there. But to yeah. be honest, I think I'd, I would happily be brainwashed 
into believing that this company, this country is amazing and we're great and the government's great and amazing and they care for everybody and everything's great. Like, please, like, Blissfully, bring, exactly, blissfully bring, bring the wall over my eyes. I don't want to see it anymore. I want to be blissfully unaware. I want to be naive and ignorant. And I, I want to believe this country's great. I don't want to wake up every day like doom scrolling and be like, oh my God, how can it get much worse? And then it gets worse. I don't want to, like, sign me up. That's it. The worst thing about politics. Where's the link? I will put my email down now. <laughs> the worst thing about politics is, oh, is, is, is doom and gloom. And I tell you what, I wish I was blissfully ignorant. I look back and think, I wish I never got into politics. Mm. I wish I was just someone who thought everything was great. Um, but I'll tell you what, though, there's some pros to this. You might get brain, we could get brainwashed. We'll come out as conservatives and everything's fine. But also, I think it's going to help with the cost of living because. If I was gonna say, account, is it going to make me richer sure. by being a conservative? No. Oh. It won't make you richer. Damn it. <laughs> but I tell you what, camp, does that mean they're going to pay for our meals and our energy? <laughs> yeah. So the cost of living would be far better for get us. Get well, so. red, you get your meals paid for. Rishi, if wow. you're watching this, yeah. we're, we're candidates to be putting your education. Yes, please, sign us up. We'll be in good company. Oh, gosh, right. Let's leave it there for this week. Thank you so much for watching. And if you like this video, please give it a like and a share. For more content from Turn Left, remember to hit that subscribe button. And if you're feeling extra generous, why not become a regular supporter for as little as £3 per month by heading to patreon.com forward slash turn left media. See you next time.